<laughs> Morning, church. It's snowing outside. Good morning, um, TV land. Make sure you shout out where you're watching from. Hey, send us pictures of the snow. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. So we're here to worship God, of course. That's what we come because he's worthy to be worshipped. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing.
have some interesting things to talk about on our Honoring a Veteran Sunday. So I got a cool display here. Hello today. You guys might want to come up here because it's pretty good. You want to hold something? Come on up because I want you to hold this and read it to me. This is what serving is all about. It's painful. All right, so, hey, isn't serving Jesus hard? Hello, if it's not hard, it's not a sacrifice, amen? That's right. Okay, so as you can see, I have a display here. Do you see this? It is Veterans Sunday, so we had Veterans Day. Just you guys remember, did you do anything in your schools for Veterans Day? Yeah. You had an assembly. Was it cool? It yeah. was amazing. Yes, it? So what was amazing about it? What was one thing you liked? The 7th and 8th grade choir and band both performed. Did they? Did they do some patriotic songs? Uh -huh. Yeah. And then What each fold meant? Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool to see, too. Mm -hmm. So this is another thing that they put on display sometimes when you go to dinners for veterans to honor our vets because it's all about honoring those who have passed away, who have um, been in the armed forces. So as you can see, we have all kinds of armed forces on here. So do you want to hold it, and do you want to read two of the armed forces? Nice and loud. United States Army and United States Marine Corps. Okay. And do you want to read one? What's this one say? Um, United States Navy. Mm -hmm. And what's this one say? That one says nothing. That might. Does anybody know what that is? Okay. What's this one say? United States Coast Guard. And we know what flag that is, right? America. Right. And did you already do this one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did I miss any? Air Force. Air Force. Yeah. This must be the Air Force. Is this a, is this a plane? Yeah. Oh, it's got wings. Good. Okay. Yeah. I'm a little slow. So anyway, so this represents all of our different um, military, uh, what do you call them? You know what I mean? Flags. Yeah. Okay. So this is called the Fallen Soldier's Table. So there is a white tablecloth. Yep. So I want you guys to, when I go ahead and talk about it, I want one of you to pick up whichever item I'm talking about. So the white tablecloth draped over the table represents the purity of their response to the country's call to arms. Because before they used to call it a draft, and if you were 18 or older, you were in. You were called and then you were in, okay? There was no option. Now you kind of have an option because we're not really at war. Well, we kind of are, but we're not. So, in that year. the empty chair. The empty chair talks about an unknown face representing no soldier, specific soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, but all who are not here with us today. So those who have passed away. The table itself, what shape is it? Circle. It's round to show that our concern for them is never ending, so we should always honor our vets. The Bible. Okay, she's got the Bible. She's going to do the Bible. You're going to do the next one. Get the black napkin ready. The single rose ready. Okay. All right. The Bible represents what? Faith in the higher power, the pledge to our country, founded one nation under God. Very good. The black napkin stands for the emptiness these warriors have left in their hearts of their families and friends. The single rose reminds us of their families and loved ones. Okay? Um, we don't have a red ribbon, so we'll skip that. Yes. We do? Um, oh, red ribbon. Thank you. The red ribbon represents the love of our country, which inspired them to answer the call. The yellow candle, you can put the Bible down, get the yellow candle, represents the everlasting hope for a joyous reunion with those yet accounted for. The slices of lemon, grab a slice. On the bread plate, the place of their bitter fate. So some of them died while they were um, at war. Salt, which I don't have. Pretend it's on that plate. Yeah, there is a few. Oh, is there a little bit of food? Okay. The salt, what do you think the salt represents? What's salty? What are these things that come out of your eyes? Tears. Represents the tears of their families. And the wine glass, turned upside down, reminds us that our distinguished comrades cannot be with us to drink a toast or join in the festivities of the day. Those are the ones that have fallen. Now I have one more question for you. You notice we have two flags on our altar. Mm -hmm. So um, one is which flag? The American flag. Do you know what this black one says? It says Palmyra. Okay, so read it in letters. P-O-W-M-I-A. Okay, so what do you think that stands for? 
prisoner of war. So we still have some that are prisoners of war or died as prisoners of war, which means they were captive, captured by enemy people. And then we have missing in action, which means they never found them. So we have soldiers that are still missing in action. And so that is how they, we represent them. No? 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 So um, now we're going to go ahead and I'm going to have you have all our veterans stand. I'm going to have you get, hand them some flags. So there's a couple for you to take out. For you to take out. <laughs> There'll be enough. Okay, so vets, if you could please stand and we'll have them come out and um, get you a flag and we'll give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so you guys learned something new today, didn't you? All right, have a seat, vets. We're going to go ahead and pray, and then guess what? I brought you candy, because why not? You can put those <laughs> on. Because I forgot the last two. Because I forgot the last two. Plus, I found a big, giant bag cheap. <laughs> Let's pray. As believers, we owe our veterans a deep debt. It is because of their sacrifice we are free to worship God today. You and I go to church, we worship, we have Bibles, and we serve God without fear of being put into prison or put to death, as some other countries face. It is in, it is in large part due to their sacrifice we have these freedoms. So thank a veteran today and pray for them because they are the ones, they are the one of the biggest reasons that we are here to worship you, Lord. We give you praise for these people who have allowed us to serve and worship you in freedom. We do not take for granted that there are millions of Christians around the world afraid of prison or even death because of what they believe. Our veterans are a significant reason why we do not fear and we thank them for them. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so go ahead, grab some candy, and then I think some of you are going downstairs. Mr. Rob's got some new uh, curriculum down there. All right, you good? Mm -hmm. Did you want to? Do you like chocolate, or do you like vanilla, or do you like orange, or do you like <laughs> cherry, or do you like green? Yes. All, of them. All of that. <laughs> <laughs> Cherries are my favorite. You're gonna have to like them for those. <laughs> All right. So our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And this is a very familiar passage. It's Jesus changes water into wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used for, by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guest has had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks. All right, I'm going to date myself. How many of you remember the show Too Close for Comfort? Yeah? Well, here's a, clip, a video clip of it. For a father who doubles as a landlord, some moments are too close for comfort. But let me straight, this is my house. I will decide who stays and who doesn't. It's also my house. Well, what about us? We live here, we pay rent, don't we have to say in this? You only paid last month's rent, so you're only entitled to say in last month's issues. <laughs> Free is comedy with Ted Knight in Too Close for Comfort, Tuesday nights at 7.30 on CKBR-TV. So too close for comfort. So you guys remember this, right? Yeah. So it's um, Henry and Muriel Rush. That is the uh, the people, the characters, and they live in this two story house. And when their downtown resident, downstairs resident, dies, his two grown up 
uh, daughters say, hey, can we live there? We're going to pay rent. Obviously, you can see that they pay rent late, right? But then they have a friend named Monroe who moves in. You guys remember Monroe? I don't know if you remember. Some of the young ones are like, what are you talking about? So Monroe moves in and lives with them. And Ted Knight, who plays um, Henry Rush, is just like, this is way too close for comfort. I didn't ask for all of you guys to move in here. You should probably move out. But then he starts sticking his nose, dad starts sticking his nose in the adult children's business, and then the adult children start saying, that's way too close for comfort. So that was the reason for the name of the show, right? So when you say, he's too close for comfort, or that's too close for comfort, usually what we're talking about is a negative situation. Either someone's gotten into our business, and it's not their business, and you're like, hey, you're too close for comfort. Or there's someone who's really intimidating and they're, they're in your face and you're like, you know, you're way too close for comfort. But either way, it's a negative situation. Would you agree when you say that, right? Yes. Well, as believers in Jesus Christ, we house the Holy Spirit in us, do we not? Jesus said you will have the Holy Spirit in you. You will believe inside. That's why the Apostle Paul says our bodies are a holy temple. We house the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is too close for comfort, is he not? He is right here living in each believer by faith. So in other words, Jesus is too close for us to be comfortable in our faith. We need to also be witnesses of our faith. And that's what we're going to talk about today as we continue our sermon series, The Chosen. We're going to learn how to be better witnesses. And we're going to use Mary, um, some clips from The Chosen. We're going to use Mary in this turning water into wine. And use her as a guide and a teacher for how to be better witnesses of the faith. Because don't you think the world needs better witnesses of the faith? You know, maybe the reason that the churches have gone downhill is because we're not witnessing. We're just coming and being fed. We're just coming and listening to music. We're just coming and seeing our friends. We're enjoying the coffee or complaining about the snacks. Amen? Right? But instead, we need to be witnessing to the faith. So Mary's going to teach us this. And we're going to look at the scripture of Jesus turning water into wine. So let's talk about what's the first thing we need to do to witness for Jesus. It's the first thing is we have to look around and we have to see and respond to needs in the world. We have to notice the need. We need to see the need. We need to notice it. And then we need to respond to it. So we know that Jesus is at a wedding with his disciples. Weddings went on for at least a week, five days. They're three days in. And what has happened? They run out of wine. Now, Mary, in this clip by The Chosen, Mary apparently knows the mother of the bridegroom, or the groom. They call him the bridegroom, but they're talking about the groom. And if they ran out of wine, uh, this was going to be a huge humiliation for this young couple. And they were going to be the talk of the town. It was going to follow them the rest of their lives. So it's, it's not like they could run down to the 7-Eleven and grab some cheap gallo wine or some cheap boxed wine. These are wineskins that have traveled quite a distance, and they're out of wine. There's, there's no other options, right? So Mary knows that there's a need. She sees the need. So let's take a look at this clip. I'm only showing one clip because it's quite a long one from The Chosen. Let's look at this one. Just watch out for the frogs this time. <laughs> oh, sons of Jonah! We're just looking for you. Now that's the son of Miriam. We thought you wouldn't want to miss it. Of course. That's the three of us. So how it's done, huh? I don't think that's such a good idea. Has four left feet. Four? <laughs> Why four? When he tries to dance, he looks like a donkey walking on hot coals. Oh, 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 Andrew, do you deny it? I've never seen a donkey walking on hot coals. Actually, that would be a terrible thing to behold. My son. Ah, Andrew, you see, even my old mother will join us in the song of meeting. They've run out of wine. But it's only the first day? Yes, and it's all gone. Why are you telling me this? We can't let the celebration end like this. And the your family humiliated. Boys, uh, go join the others. I'm going to end it.
fill these jars with water. I'm not sure you heard her clearly, but we've run out of wine, not water. These are similar in size to your own foray. The prudent monks, yes. Equally filled all the way to the brim. You're a very responsible person, aren't you? We are in a crisis, and I was led to understand you have a solution. Do you know why jars for purification rites are made of stone? <laughs> what? You heard me. Because the stone is pure. Less likely to stain or break, and it can't be made unclean. Yes. Fill these jars with water all the way to the brim. Why? You heard him. Start throwing water, quickly. Tell anyone you find to stop what they're doing and help. From the directions you have provided, I see no logical solution to the problem. It's going to be like that sometimes, Thomas. What did you say? I do not rebuke you. It is good to ask questions, to seek understanding. There is no time for this. I know of a man like you in Capernaum, always counting, always measuring. That's my job. And the people will think I have not done well tonight. Join me. And I will show you a new way to count and measure. A different way of seeing time. Go with you where? first cut into the stone, it can't be on that. It sets in motion a series of choices. What used to be a shadow. 
shapeless block of limestone, the granite begins its long journey of transformation. And it will never be the same. serve the poorer wine, the cheap stuff. <laughs> because by then, who is going to notice? <laughs> Am I right? But you, you have chosen now to serve the best wine I have ever tasted. Let us thank them for this unnecessary but honorable gesture. Jesus, 
and Jesus. In John 2, verses 3 and 4, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. And he says, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. Did you notice that Mary doesn't go to Jesus and say, They have no more wine. This is what I think they sh we should do. We should get a mission statement. We should start a new program. We should come up with a really cool idea. She takes the problem, the need, directly to Jesus. And that's exactly what the church has to do. The church has to take the need that people are getting further and further away from the faith, and we need to take it to Jesus. And we need to wait for an answer. How many times have we taken our problems to Jesus, or have we taken our problems or our issues or our angers to Facebook? <laughs> How many people have taken their, their positions to Facebook? Yeah, yeah, some of us have. And do you notice that um, Jesus doesn't say he's going to solve the problem. He says, why do you concern me? In other words, he's saying, well, it sounds like they should have got a better, better wedding planner. <laughs> they should have got somebody that could count how many people were going to come and bring enough wine and maybe a little bit of extra wine. He goes, my hour hasn't come yet. And so now they embellish on the chosen, saying, Mary says, please, and Mary says, do this. Mary didn't say none of that in the scripture, did she? But they're embellishing it. So the third thing a witness does is that she believes before the answer comes. She believes before the answer comes. How do we know? She says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do we believe that God is already preparing in the hearts of people that we witness to? He's already preparing their hearts to hear what they need to hear from us. When's the last time you shared your faith? When's the last time you told your testimony? When's the last time you shared how God has changed your life with someone? Or how he's gotten you through a difficult time? Or how you've been unsure about something, but you took the need to him, and he discerned, and he brought you someone to speak to you. Or the right doctor, or the right treatment, or the right this, or the right that. Mary believes before the answers come. Maybe the reason people don't respond positively to the church's testimony is because we ain't believing that Jesus got the answer before we ever go out the door. Maybe we're the ones who was doubting. They embellished again and said that the guy who provided the wine was doubting Thomas. You picked up on that, right? Was it? We don't know. Maybe. Doesn't say it wasn't. So maybe we don't even believe that Jesus can do what he says he's going to do. And so we're afraid to go out and witness. We're afraid to invite people to things that we're doing. Because, you know, we might not say the right thing or we might not do the right thing. Mary trusted that Jesus would meet the need. All he had to do was tell the servants what to do. So essentially, Mary is saying what the Apostle John writes in his prologue, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let me rephrase that. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. So Mary believes that Jesus is the word of God, has come from heaven down to earth and is walking and talking. So if the word of God is there in the flesh, anything Jesus says and anything he does is eternal, right? Anything Jesus says and anything he does meets the need of people, right? Anything Jesus says and anything he does is life-giving, right? So when you tell your testimony, what are you talking about? How Jesus changed your life. Who is Jesus? The word of God. Right? God. So every time you talk about how Jesus, the word of God, God in the flesh, changed your life, there's power in that. There's power for it to meet the need of the person that you're talking to. Do you get this whole witnessing thing? Nobody wants to witness anymore. Everybody wants to sit in the pew and be fed. And, you know, it's, it's sickening, really. It's tiring. It's exhausting. The word of God is in your testimony. The word of God just turned a bunch of water into wine. The word of God, when Jesus speaks, ever since Jesus was born, is still God in the flesh. So everything he did, everything he talked about, everything he showed the world is life-giving, is life-changing. If you don't think your testimony is life-changing, we're in trouble, folks. We're in trouble. And I think that's why people don't want to come to church. They don't even think about God because the witnesses 
you will be my witnesses right in your own backyard, he says, right in Samaria, right? In Judea and to the ends of the earth. And we can't even share how Jesus has changed our lives with, what, the Sunday school kids? How many, how many, how many people we have volunteering for Sunday school, Kelly? Three? Three, four. Or a coworker or a friend. It's very hard to witness to family, I'm here to tell you. It's very hard, but that doesn't mean we don't do it. <laughs> we still try, don't we? We still try to witness because our witness has the word of God in it because we are changed by Jesus, right? He changed us. I used to be this way, I met Jesus, and now I'm this way. Right? There's power in that. We don't think there's power in that. I should be able to call up any believer in Jesus Christ in this church. They should be able to come up here and they should be able to tell me in five sentences or less how Jesus has changed their life. Because Peter says, be ready to tell why you have such joy. Are you ready? Who's ready? Who's ready to come up? <laughs> ben? Want you? Yeah. Come on. Come on up, Ben. Okay. When he said go, we go. Right? This is Ben, the one who does all the work behind the scenes. Isn't he great? Yeah. <laughs> and he always wears his periodic table shirt to a trivia, and we never get a periodic table question. We did this week. We, 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 did. we did. We did this week. We did. We cheat. We try to cheat without looking at our phones. So, for those of you who don't know, I suffer from depression. Um, when I turned 20, it hit me really hard, and I almost, I did flunk out of, I flunked out of Michigan Tech, basically, because I was insomnia and just didn't want to do anything and it, it took me a long time to get past that and eventually I just gave it up to God and just said, like just lead me one day to the next and he has ever since and I've seen it I've been through rough rough patches and he's always been there for me when like I was I was almost I had to, I was trying to get the story straight. I, I was working a job I hated. I was barely making enough money. My student loans were coming due. I couldn't defer them anymore. And like, I was wondering, what am I going to do? And then later that year, I got a new job. I moved back up here. I've been going strong ever since. You know, I still get depression on times. I sit down, I pray. I know what's coming. I know I can get through it. You're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> when God moves in the service, you go with it, right? Not on my sheet, is it, Ben? Nope. He gets to read my pathetic manuscript every time. And it's pathetic, really. I just look at it and go, this is crap. And God does something, you know. Uh, your grace is sufficient for me. I will prove my power in your weakness kind of thing. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know everything. All you got to do is tell your story. That's all you got to do. Mary believed before Jesus gave the answer. Mary believed before the need was there. Ben believed before he got the job. You see how it works? And yet that story and him telling it to the people out there and the people here have already changed your life, hasn't it? It's already moved you to a different place. The fourth thing a witness has to do is to continue to reveal God's abundant grace that they've received to others. How? By telling others that Jesus doesn't just change their lives, he gives them the best life. He gives them the best life. John 2, 9b through 10. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. When we witness to others, do we believe that Jesus is the best answer for them? Do we believe that when someone tells us they have cancer and it's inoperable, do we believe that Jesus is the best answer? Or do we try to send them to another doctor? Or do we say, well, you know, that oncologist isn't so good. I would go to this one. No, you need to go to Jesus. That's who you need to go to. And we got the best news. We've got the best news. It's Jesus. He can meet the need of whatever that person needs. We don't know exactly what they need. We don't know what their deepest desire is, but Jesus does. All we got to do is show up, 
pray, open our mouths, tell our stories, and God prepares their hearts. The Spirit of God is not just in the church gathered together, although in a very powerful way. The Spirit of God is out looking, seeking the lost, preparing their hearts for us to come and meet them at Sam's Club and have a chat with them in the grocery store about how, you know what, God's really changed my life. If God has not changed your life, what is your witness, folks? If he's not the best thing in your life, what is? Because if you can't say Jesus is the best thing in my life, then you got to look to see what it is that you're making an idol. Money, reputation, power. we got to believe, like Mary did, that Jesus is going to give us the best, and they're gonna, he's going to give the best to that person. The last thing a witness does is understand that miracles don't usually bring people to faith. I'll say it again. Miracles don't usually bring people to faith. It's hard to believe, isn't it? In verse 11, it says, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee, this is the Apostle John writing, was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. Did you catch that? His disciples believed him. How many people were at the wedding? Hundreds. How many people believed? Twelve. Or I don't even think he's called all his disciples yet. Four. He just turned water into wine. Where did they think that the wine came from? The servants knew. But just the disciples believed. And soon to be Thomas. It doesn't say the disciples believed and so did the servants who were filling the water on those jugs and watching it turn to wine. Watching it turn to wine. It doesn't say they believe. John would have said it if they believed. John would have wrote that down. Because that's what John does. Miracles don't usually bring people to faith. I'll give you an example. I found out when Trina Schuler died, I was at the women's retreat. And I was to be at the school, but I was at the women's retreat. And I was kind of upset. I was upset about the whole thing. You know, so many people were praying for her. And then I found out that Brian's co-worker, Dave Nowak, took a turn for the worse. And we know he didn't make it. And so I go upstairs, and I'm going to go talk to the pastor. Because, you know, that's what you do. They have a prayer room. And I went up there. It's kind of, you know, I wanted to be, be with the ladies, but I also wanted to get rid of this burden. And so I just talked a little bit, and I said, you know, of all times for God to do a miracle, wouldn't that have been the time? I mean, really, you got all these people praying that probably have never prayed before. Why don't you show a miracle? Come on. And he said to me, you know, most people don't come to faith in Christ when they see a miracle. And boy, did I want to slap him. I was like, mm, I don't like you. But he's right. I know people that have been literally pulled out of cars, pulled out of crushed cars. I've been to enough crushed cars to pick up hearing aids to pick up eyeglasses, because the people are still alive. I have heard, I have seen people pulled up from death. I mean, the angel, the death angel has their, his hands around their neck and literally pulled from death. And they know that there was an angel there. And it wasn't the angel of death. It was someone with their hand on their shoulder. And you hear these stories all the time. I know people that have been pulled out of their houses and lived to tell about it. And yet, they say they're changed, but... Years later, they go back to the way they were. They go back to the way they were. I want you to look at John 4, 48, because Jesus confirms this, that miracles don't normally bring people to faith. This is the question. This is a question that he asked the Roman official with the sick son. Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? This wasn't, will you never believe in me? Oh, you need to see a sign. No, this is, will you never believe in me unless you see a miraculous sign or a wonder? I recently heard this guy. This is a classic story about how they don't come to faith. I heard the story of this guy who literally has told me, 10, 12 years ago, I was pulled from the brink of death. I fell from this mountain. And I should have died, and I walked away. And I know that was Jesus, and I know he saved me. And I said, oh, wow, that's an amazing story. What did he save you for? Well, to go out and tell everybody this. I said, are you in a church? Yeah. Do you serve? Well, you know. 
I don't serve because, you know, I got things to do and, you know, my schedule's crazy. I said, go clean the toilets at midnight. Well, I told my, I told my buddy, the pastor, that I should get up and tell my story. Yeah, get up and tell your story and then go sit behind the computer and try to run my mic as I get loud and then I get quiet. I get loud and then I get quiet. Well, I'm busy. He didn't come to faith. He thinks he's got a faith. He ain't got no faith. And if he's got faith, he's a baby in the faith. And guess what he's got to do? He's got to go serve. He's got to go serve. And he's got to be around the other Christians who know exactly what it's like to be new in the faith and how that can be snatched away, the whole seed that gets on the rocky ground and then the birds come and pull it away. He's in that area, that time in his life that Jesus is going to get sucked right out of him if he doesn't. If he doesn't come to faith and come to know Christ, do what God has told us to do. Witness. John calls Jesus' miracle a sign. He calls all his miracles signs. What do signs do? We've had this conversation before. Signs point people to things. Restrooms. That way. What's the sign you go and find when you go to a giant craft show? Where are the bathrooms? Right, ladies? Where are the bathrooms? (laughs) You need to know where the bathrooms are. Or you're in a crowded room and you're like, where's the exit? I got to know. My firefighter guys, where are the exit? I gotta know where it's at. Gotta get out. <laughs> Signs point you to things, directions. <laughs> Jesus' miracles don't bring people to faith. I hate to say it, but quit praying for miracles. We should pray for miracles. I'm not saying he doesn't. If you look around, he does all kinds of miracles. But it doesn't bring people to the faith because more and more people are leaving the church and more and more people are leaving the faith. And we see miracles all around us, don't we? We see healings, we see miraculous healings, we see people. Um, you know, relationships that are completely broken come back together. We see people walk away from crushed cars. We see it all the time. And yet we, we see it on the news and people still don't come to faith. Signs, these miraculous signs are more, they're more than just this supernatural miracle. It's a sign to show God's power and strength. And what does it mean? It means that Jesus is still working in our lives and in our world today. And that is something to witness to, isn't it, folks? That is something to witness to. You know what the real miracle is? It's when somebody comes to church all by themselves and they're in a broken relationship and they cry the entire time and someone offers them a donut. I didn't say celery. I said a donut. (laughs) And they have a seat next to them and they listen to them. And that person writes a note that says, thank you so much for helping me get through this hard time. This church is amazing. I love you. And I love Jesus. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. A change of a heart. And that's what Mary witnessed to. She saw the need. She took the need to Jesus. She believed before he ever did anything. Just listen to what he has to say. She believed. And then what did she do? She told the world. Don't you think Mary continued to tell the world about what he had done? I was at this wedding. They say it was one day and I say it was three days and it's an interpretation. Either way, they're out of line. They got a whole week to do to give wine. And he performs a miracle so that he can show that he is with them and loves them and cares enough about them. Mary didn't beg. Maybe she did. Mary believed. Jesus doesn't do healings for people that beg. He does healings for people that believe because they have to, you have to have a believer on the other end for it to stick or someone whose heart's ready to believe. Miracles don't change people or bring them to faith. Our testimonies do. And as Revelation says, they will overcome this evil world by what? The blood of the Lamb. Right? And the word of their testimony. Speak up. Speak out. Tell your story. Be a witness. The world needs it. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for not letting the faith in our minds fully transform our lives. Help us to trust you, Jesus, like Mary did. 
before the miracle. Help us to witness to the truth that you, Jesus, are the best thing for everyone. We have to believe it before we can share it. Give us faith in the name of Christ. Amen. So we got a few more of those um, chosen sermon series stuff that we got. I don't know what's next. Who knows? So right now we're going to do prayers. So go ahead and write down your prayers. I've got ten minutes. <coughs> Plenty of time. So go ahead and write down your prayers for um, what you want to pray about, those online. And the rest of you just raise a hand and let us know what you'd like us to pray for. It goes on. Julie's writing them down, and then it goes on to our prayer chain. What do we have to pray for? Yeah. Me for health. And our, uh, for health? And our um, grandson and his wife. Okay. Grandson. Oh, Jordan and Alyssa. Thank you. Sue. Answers for Larry and some tests. Um, yeah. Bill. My daughter Megan. Your daughter Megan for personal? Yes. Okay. Nancy? For God over our military and I believe the United States Space Force is also a branch of our military. The United States what? Space Force. Oh, yeah. United States Space Corps? Space Force. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. All right. Well, there we go. Thank you. Larry? Well, I just appreciate, you know, whether you're so lit or, you know, additional prayers, but I don't like it, but whatever it is, it's it is. the plan. Okay. Yep. Well, we're just going to pray anyway. We're going to pray for, we're going to pray for those miracles, or we're also going to pray for peace and answers, because answers are what people need. They need answers, and we know that Jesus always has the best answer. Got it? So for Dick, for cancer and COVID, and for Sherry, his wife. Yeah. Kelly? We need prayers for my grandma Lorraine and also just for our family. Okay, so Grandma Lorraine has allowed me to mention that she has cancer. And it um, seems like it's progressing quickly. And she's in the hospital. So that's Lorraine Duell. Lorraine, not Lorraine, Lorraine. And um, so we want to pray for her because her family can't really go in and see her because Munson's at red. So that makes it difficult. Um, and for Fred, who misses her dearly, and for their family. She is well-loved by this church, and um, I know she's being well-loved by Christ. So continue to pray for Lorene as she gets further tests. Connie? Children in St. Jude. Okay, children in St. Jude. Thank you. For Joyce for health. Joyce for health, thank you. She's improving. She's getting better. That's good because half the time you don't tell us her that she's getting better. Her vertigo is about done. Okay, they figured out a way to. That's one step. That's one step. That, that stuff is terrible. Tony. Okay, I have a praise report. I received a text from uh, Tim Sheetsley yeah. uh, this week. And um, first he said pray because he was going to, through uh, ankle surgery. Well, yes. then he texted me later and said that it was. Yes, so Tim Sheetsley's had ankle surgery. It's a success. We've um, got some guys that are going to um, help him get out and about or at least maybe go do some shopping for them for him. So continue to pray for Tim Sheetsley, who's in Traverse City. He would be here if he could. Um, so we'll continue to pray. Yeah. relationships for understanding and for Allison who has COVID but she's been she's at home so um Leon okay so for Steve so for some treatment for Steve okay thank you Carol unspoken prayers thank you unspoken Zita yes for my son Robin he's had he hasn't been able to eat very much for the last two months. Mm -hmm. and okay. You don't know what's wrong he there? He needs to go to the doctor and find out why. Yeah. We lost so. 30 some pounds. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, and so for Robin son. to get to the doctor, yes, if something's not son, right. Tobin, who's helping me with this business with the bank? And Tobin for his help. 
joy for Tobin and his health. Other prayers? Yes. I do have the joy. Five years ago, they said I had stage four cancer. And it took me a while to realize that God's like, I'm not through with you yet. Mm -hmm. And then to realize who he wanted me to help, what he wanted me to do, and to realize it doesn't have to be, I don't have to go to Africa and save all the natives over there. I just have to maybe make a care bear for somebody or right. give somebody a pat on the back or, or hold him up when he sleeps in church. So. Yeah. No, it's not leaving in church, Leah. You're giving me a bad rap. He listens to every word. I know he does. So, yeah, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a small thing. And it's usually what you're gifted at doing. And you're gifted at doing so many things. So, and you're five-year cancer-free, so that deserves a round of applause. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, Maggie. Um, just prayers for hope and courage as healthcare workers are facing challenges and burnout. So. Yep. Yeah. For our healthcare workers. I'm going to throw my nephew, Jake, in, who needs a job and needs to move out of his parents' house. <laughs> and he really wants to, so he needs a job. So for him. Yeah. For all those that don't feel comfortable getting the vaccine, they're being put out of work because of it. Okay. So for our issues there with the vaccination. All right. <clears throat> yeah, Joe. Keep the deer hunters safe. Yes, thank you. Keep the deer hunters safe. And the deer. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon Case? Yeah, Sharon Case fell. What is she doing? And she's supposed to go in for some some kind of surgery. Hip surgery, and Hip surgery. she fell and broke her medulla. She didn't break it, she smashed she it. She crushed it, yeah. Her, that's the neat thing. On the other side of her hip. I mean, she had both sides. So this one hurts, and this one's broken. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we need to pray for Sharon. And what a joy for our football team. What a great season they had. So go Stags. Livia? Keep the hunting dog safe. Good. Thank you. All right. Unspoken. Unspoken. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for our veterans and for those who serve in our military, now active military, those that are vets that are here with us. We thank you for their service and those we remember that have given their lives for us to be able to come here and pray. So we give you thanks for that. We pray for those that have been diagnosed with cancer. We know, Lord, that you're going to continue and guide and direct their decisions and their steps. Pour on your presence in a powerful way so they know that you are with them throughout all of this. Be with their families as they're probably afraid. But, Lord, that is what you tell us a number of times. Do not be afraid because I've overcome the world. So we will hold you to that. We will trust in that. And we will try to witness to that. Thank you for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. All right, now it's time for our offering, so Ben's going to put up a link there, and you can pay by PayPal, or you can always send a check to P.O. Box 395, Kingsley, Michigan, 49649. Um, our Grateful Giving Jar is going to Christmas in Kingsley, which is an event that we have here in downtown Brownson, and Kingsley United Methodist Church is going to bring a live nativity. So um, I've got some guys helping me put together a manger, and I'm going to be Gabriel, and give them some angel facts. You know, angels don't have halos. You know, angels are messengers of God. They're not fat little cherub that float around, and, you know. <laughs> so we're going to have some of that. So we're, giving, we're getting out biblical truths to people in easy ways to understand. It. So let's say a prayer for our offering. Gracious God, we praise you, for you answer our prayers. Lead us to look around and recognize the people to whom we can show compassion. Let the money we give today be used to address the concerns of people in need, both locally and in the wider church. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, please stand your
<laughs> I have a pool. Don't start to sing. Hey, this Wednesday is our another community dinner. Yes. What's on Yay. the menu? We're having chili. Yay! Yay. And then uh, we're going to have a trivia night here this Saturday night, so the information is there. And if you can't join us in person, there's a link. And Ben's got that all figured out. Yeah, you can do it online. Yeah. Online trivia. But bring a phone or a tablet. Sounds like a fun time. And then um, we're going to start thinking about the Christmas giving tree. And so that stuff is happening. And so there's some meetings there if you want to get involved. Yep. And we have a lead team meeting this Tuesday at 630. So we're going to try to button up our end of the year stuff. So if you're on the lead team, please come. If you're not, you can come anyway. And this is really our ministries, our outreach and all the different things we do. We really got to get ourselves figured out till the end of the year. And that trivia, even if you don't know how to use an iPad or a tablet, come because we'll put you on a team with someone who does. Yep. It's really fun. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for reminding us that we are your witnesses. We're it. We're the peeps. We're the ones that got to go out and share the good news. So give us the strength and the knowledge and the power to do it. In the name of Christ, amen. All right. Go on downstairs.